speaker this afternoon is Dr. Anne Coville, and uh, Anne is Associate Professor at Mount Allison in Art History. She's also an active independent curator in contemporary and historical art. Notably, last spring, she curated the exhibition Muse at the Banff Park Museum in partnership with the White Museum with the artists Janice Wright Cheney, Darcy Wilson, and Amanda Dawn Christie. Previously, she curated the exhibition Paper Dolls, which included the archival material of handmade paper dolls by the poet Sylvia Plath, with the work of seven contemporary artists, including um, Cindy Sherman. And this show traveled uh, from the Owens Art Gallery to the Mendel in 2012. But um, uh, Dr. Ann Koval is also noted as a, is known as a, an important scholar on James McNeil Whistler, and she co-wrote um, the book on James uh, um, McNeil Whistler Beyond um, the Myth, in, which was reissued in 2002. And uh, she also recently wrote on the artist William Blair Bruce for the exhibition catalog Into the Light, which was produced by the Art Gallery of Hamilton. This afternoon, she's going to be talking about Mary Pratt, still life as self-portraiture, because she, her most recent project will be um, developing a biography on this artist. So, Anne, it's all yours. Okay, um, just figuring it out. Is this good? Okay. Oops. I'll, put, I'll just put my notes here. Up more? Okay. Okay, is that better? Okay. Um, as Rachel said, this is a new project for me. I am not a Mary Pratt expert yet, um, but I've been very interested in her work, and I have um, the advantage of living in um, Sackville, New Brunswick, and um, having access to the archive at Mount Allison University, where she has donated her papers and continues to do so. So this project arose out of that interest, and also um, the way I've, I look at her still life in particular as, as a form of self-portraiture. Mary Pratt, long known for her still life painting, rarely paints self-portraits. However, when looking more closely at her art, in particular the still life painting, we can begin to see how connected this work is to her life and how it can be read as a form of self-portraiture. With the recent retrospect of Mary Pratt as timely acknowledgement of the artist, this paper addresses the critical need to position her work within the wider context of still life painting, self-portraiture, and feminist art history. I would like to begin by talking about a little-known self-portrait painted um, as her Mount Allison University diploma painting. Part of the requirement for graduation uh, from fine art students, it's no longer the case, um, but was for students to paint a self-portrait, and both Christopher and Mary Pratt produced uh, self-portraits in 1961 that became part of the Owens Art Gallery inventory. In the late 70s, the gallery director was culling this collection of these former student self-portraits in the vault, and Mary Pratt's self-portrait was removed and returned to her in Newfoundland. Christopher's was not. This slide taken by Christopher is all that remains of this early work, so she destroyed it. And I'm still trying to work out um, if she was angry or not. She claims she wasn't, but I think there's some documentation that says otherwise that I'm still looking for. The original portrait is spatially interesting. Pratt positions herself in the interior of a room, her back to an open door that opens into another door. This complex play of space is rare in Pratt's work. She is pouring water from a jug into a blue bowl more in the tradition of a Vermeer painting than a self-portrait. The painting recalls Vermeer's Milkmaid of 1657. There's more depth of space in the Pratt, but the reflections against the door frame show an early interest in how light falls on objects. Another Vermeer comes to mind, the Met painting um, that shows a young woman with a water pitcher of 18 
uh, or sorry, 1662. All three women, Mary, the milkmaid, the young woman, are positioned next to a table. The table in Pratt's portrait interrupts the space between the viewer and the subject. When we are assured that she's in a domestic space, we are unsure of her role. She appears not to be in the role of the painter, as many young students often portrayed themselves. Already a young mother, her role was more ambiguous, and this self-portrait is revealing in that we too, like Pratt, are unsure. Looking at the two Vermeer paintings side by side, we see 17th century Dutch women, one posing as a maid, the other appearing in finer clothing, perhaps meant to portray the woman of the house. One can argue that as Pratt's own language of still life painting develops, this interaction between the domestic, the maid, the housewife, is played out in the imagery. As Werner Reed in Women, in Women Between writes, Pratt the painter, and I'll just go back to Pratt so we can look at her, um, chose as her initial subject the everyday activities and domestic environment of Pratt, the wife and mother. In doing so, she began what has essentially an essentially, what has remained essentially autobiographical visual art practice. Later, however, she confirmed publicly that her art is, in fact, not a series of random images, but a form of personal autobiography, so that her body of work follows chronologically and expresses emotionally the stages and issues in her life experience." End of quote. Norman Bryson, in, in his critical study on still life painting, uh, looking at the overlooked, writes on the cleanliness depicted in Dutch interior scenes and the importance of good housekeeping as a sign of domestic virtue. Mary Pratt, coming from a staid middle-class home in Fredericton, was brought up with cleanliness not only as a physical requirement, but as an aesthetic way of seeing. Writing in her journal of seven, 1977, she admits that her keen domesticity had little effect on her family. Nobody else cares, you see. Nobody else sees it. Since I'm the only one to care, I suppose I should see that it's done. Clean tables, clear surfaces where the sun can fall in regular patterns, broad expanses of clean floor where the shadows fall in straight lines, uninterrupted by discarded socks. Is it their moral duty to see the world the way I see it? Probably not. Even within her confession, there is an awareness of the importance of looking. To Pratt, the subject-object relationship was always a rich territory to mine. The art historian Uwe Laura Berkshart, in The Object as Subject, from the Lure of the Object, writes on Chardin, one of Pratt's favorite artists. Chardin's still lives call for a recognition of the object in terms different than a mere physical thing, or its more or less convincing imitation. Rather, Chardin's still lives, some of them in any case, suggest a kind of strange romance with the object as at once a material thing and an imaginary spectral entity, something experienced on the psychic register, which is what renders the process of representation as infinitely complex. Nowhere in the subject-object relationship more, is more significant than in Pratt's kitchen where she prepared meals on a daily basis. Often the moments depicted are contained a slice of life. Her making of preserves is a good example of this. Pratt states, I think that in fact the whole thing is me. I understand the making of jelly from the time I was a child. We made jelly at home, always make, made jelly. I picked those berries, I'd grown those berries, they were familiar to me. The making of jelly was part of my life. The skin on the jelly as it began to form and reflects the blue of the sky down. All of this stuff I've observed since I was old enough to see. I love that stuff so much uh, that when my mother put it into the cellar to keep it, I used to put glass bottles in my bedroom full of red liquid so I could look at it. I just loved the look. This last winter, as I entered uh, the retrospective exhibition of Mary Pratt that traveled from the rooms to, um, what, what gallery? Michael, thank you. To uh, the art gallery of uh, Nova Scotia, 
um, I was able to, uh, I entered and saw uh, a documentary playing as you enter the space of, of, of the gallery. In the film, Pratt tells me, my life is what I paint. Throughout the exhibition, I'm reminded that this is her reality. She paints what is right there in front of her. Yet it's not that simple. Within these still life paintings and even the Donna paintings, there is a complex coded and even cryptic language. Marguerite Rowell, the curator of the 1997 MoMA exhibition, Objects of Desire, the Modern Still Life, sees still life as an ideal rather, as an ideal rather than a reality. She considers the still life as a selection of objects situated in a spatial field that is part of a self-contained system of signs or language that is often self-referential or telling about the period, for instance, the Dutch 17th century culture. But within the still life, there's often embedded a self-portrait, a contained, reflected self. This embeddedness harks on much earlier traditions of the still life going back to the 17th century. Much of this work, including that of Pratt, has a gendered and subversive quality. The still life is a genre that has long been associated with the feminine, both in practice and ideology. From its development as a genre in the 17th century Netherlands, the Flemish painter Clara Peters was one of the earliest women artists to excel at this genre. In the still life entitled Flowers with Ceramic Dish, Money, and Drinking Goblets of 1612, as shown here, um, the painting operates as a self-portrait and was one of the first to show the artist reflected back on numerous surfaces as seen in the goblet on the far right. And here's a detail of that, uh, of that goblet and you can see the reflections. Reflected 12 times in the gilded bosses, these convex surfaces act as a shifting signifier of the artist. More than mere imitation, the artist has endorsed her work in this self-reflexive manner and indicated to her contemporaries the tour de force of the artist at work. Marriott uh, Westerman, a Dutch specialist writing on um, another still life painter, Peter Klaus, um, that also includes uh, a self-portrait, as you can see in the orb on the left. She says, many still life painters played with the image of painting as a faithful mirror by including reflecting surfaces and by mirroring their studios and themselves in them. In what seems a standard vanitas arrangement, Peter Klaus included not only the requisite skull, overturned glass, and timepiece, but also a glass ball that, uh, glass ball, um, of painting this very still life. Like so many of his contemporaries, Klaus destabilized the Vanitas theme by including his own portrait, the genre of, of painting most intended to immortalize people in paint. So that was uh, Marit Westerman. So I'm just going to show you a detail of that reflected um, self-portrait in the orb. And then I thought it would be interesting to look at Klaus alongside the detail of the Mary Pratt, where you can see very clearly her own reflection. And what's interesting is both uh, the oil and the watercolor by Pratt really um, testified to the sort of virtuosity of, of the painter to be able to ch achieve this. Following in the tradition of Dutch and, and Flemish still life painting, uh, Pratt's work is not what it seems. In her journals now housed in the Mount Allison archive, she has recorded her need to define herself and her work as distinct from Christopher's, her husband. I think, I have to think everything is valid, everything I see because I only have what is inside this house, this garden. My only strength is in finding something where most people would find nothing. I refuse to adopt his point of view. It can't be mine. The sense of validation of perceptual understanding is crucial in understanding how Mary Pratt depicts her world. It is born of the isolation of place, Samanier in Newfoundland, of the need to define herself as an artist when Christopher Pratt was getting all of the attention. Pratt's life is so intertwined with her art that despite the fact that we are not seeing her physically depicted, she is everywhere in her art. For Pratt, the problematics of the domestic were very real as she tackled the dual role of emerging artist and busy mother. 
In the late 1960s, on the suggestion of Christopher, she began to employ photography as a means to still the moment long enough to paint. The remains of a meal that Christopher photographed for her in 1969 became the painting Supper Table, and this is a critical moment in her career. Returning to the idea of the Dutch maid or housewife, I cannot help but see a parallel to the life and art of Mary Pratt. In her early journals, the entries are full of housekeeping concerns. Her days are measured out with four young children and domestic responsibilities. In her now famous supper table, where Pratt first makes use of photography as a visual aid, we are made aware of this, as Catherine, Catherine Maston has observed in her essay, Base, Place, Location, and the Early Paintings. Pratt's post-war era family table is a constant site of labor, meal after meal, which all fell to Mary with no foreseeable end." end of quote. Looking at the supper table, I think of the banality of the subject matter, the leftovers of a meal, hot dogs, the relish, mustard, ketchup, hot sauce, all the labels and evidence. Pratt brushes up against pop art here, or perhaps the deadpan photographs of Ed Rusha are the more common link. The photorealist technique was per perfectly suited to Mary Pratt's interest in light and detail. As she later stated, I could see so many things I hadn't seen before, all kinds of light and shadow, um, and how a ketchup bottle has, hasn't just got an outside, but an inside too. For Pratt, the camera becomes the means of liberating her technique, allowing for her to paint on the run. And I think the camera also operated as a kind of mirroring device and lens. Pratt's strategy did not come easily to her. Trained traditionally at Mount Allison University, she struggled with using photography as a medium. As Tom Smart points out in his book, The Substance of Light, just as Pratt began using photography in her painting, she was aligning herself with the more current debates about around new realism. On seeing an exhibition of Alex Colville's drawings, including the meticulous preparatory stu studies he's known for, Pratt writes in her journal how much she admires them, regards them as studies uh, of works of art in themselves, and wishes she could work in this considered manner. Then she reflects, it would have been impossible for me. I hardly had any time to paint. Sometimes I think the clothes on the ironing board were my sketches. I wanted to be a painter. I wanted to be a wife. I wanted to be a mother. I wanted it all. I love this defiance, this reality check that constantly weaves in and out of her journals and is, in and is present in the work itself. Um, in her use of photography, she found her way into her art. Christopher was very resourceful and knew his wife would fall for the slides he took. She soon began to use the camera herself. Ned Pratt, their son, a gifted photographer, has commented that there's a complex play between the photographic image and her painting. He, seems, he sees the photographs as providing her with a depth of field and reflection of light. According to Mary Pratt, the photographs in the painting find me claiming that photography provides an objectivity necessary for painting. The photographs keep me cold. There's no room for being messy and nostalgic. End of quote. This sediment, sentiment echoes Gerhard Richter's methodology when he claims the photograph, quote, keeps you from stylizing, from seeing falsely, from giving an overly personal interpretation to the subject. Although Richter often utilizes appropriated photographs, this distance, distancing factor is important to both artists. The philosopher Peter Osborne has written on Richter's work, photo painting acts to to add a moment of cognitive self-reflection. It creates a space and a time for reflection upon that image which is qualitatively different from that of the photograph it's itself, haunted as such experience is by the trace of the object. Osborne's observations can equally apply to Pratt's work that suggest a strangeness or haunted quality. Pratt herself has commented on her work. People will find out that each one of the paintings, there's something that ought to disturb them, something upsetting. That is why I painted them. I see this as akin to the writing of Alice Munro, with her deep, dark, and subversive narratives. Like Munro, they both look at the particular to explore more universal themes. Karen uh, Pynchon, reviewing for the Globe and Mail on Pratt's retrospective, writes on the painting, in their beauty, there is an intentional darkness, 
a sense something is deeply wrong, powered by Pratt's subversive vision that a well-lived life is defined by its cracks, tears, and wounds. On viewing her retrospective, I see that she has monumentalized the everyday. It is as though every painting is saying, look at me, I am here. There is a discourse. The paintings are representing objects larger than life, realistically, a hyper-real quality. She enlarges the ordinary objects of her domestic life through scale and makes them extraordinary. But as Pynchon has suggested, there's much more at stake than beautiful paintings. On um, one of the first works in the Pratt retrospective is this particular painting. And she says of it, the painting marked the end of my marriage to Christopher. When I was painting, I didn't realize what a tragic image it was. But when I saw it framed and hanging in my dealer's gallery, I was embarrassed that so much of me was on view. The painting is imbued with meaning, often only recognized by Pratt much later. There's a symbolic quality that emerges as slowly as the process of painting. As she said, the reality comes first, the symbol comes after. I see these things and suddenly they become symbolic of life. In one of her journals of the 1990s, she observes, observes, only in my painting, which takes days, weeks, months, the edges of the real merge with the philosophical, and eventually all is solved in some unreal and symbolic way that has little to do with the real. In a painting, Eggs in an Egg Crate, uh, done in the aftermath of the death of her one-day-old son, David, and his twin, who had already died in an earlier stage of pregnancy, the unseen latent symbolism was pointed out by a friend. Pratt commented, the loss of the twins still means more to me than I care to admit. I had to uh, it had to affect my work. The first painting I did after I lost the twins was eggs in an egg crate. All the eggshells were empty, a fact I failed to notice. As with death, there's also life. And pr Pratt is very passionate about speaking of the erotic quality of her art. In the current small exhibition at the National Gallery called This Little Masterpiece in Focus, Pratt was interviewed by the curator Jonathan Shaughnessy. It's difficult to talk about, but I do get this erotic charge from vision. I think the world comes to me through my senses, and that's why I get this charge. The world doesn't come to me through my eyes exactly. It comes to me through every bit of me, and I think that I'm very lucky from that point of view. Pratt describes how she looks closely, taking hold of a pebbled watered glass, she's talking to Shaughnessy, the curator, um, that she had in front of her. My paintings begin in the world. If you were me and you were doing the painting, and if you were painting this glass, there's all kinds of amazing stuff going on here. I see this as a phenomenological aspect within her work, where she embodies the subject, takes it within her. Pratt continues, there's a painting of raspberries that I did where there are all kinds of little glass blobs and every blob is different from every other glass blob and every one of them has to be given its full due. Um, so she goes on and talks about this and she says, I just thought it, of it as being a painting of things that I, for some reason or other, found erotically necessary to have, to have forever. And I hope that I could bring that erotic charge to my paintings. I don't think I always did, but that's not the point. I wanted to remember that. I, it, was an, it was a love affair with vision, a real love affair with vision. By taking the subject within her, she is able to arrive at a work that is largely the experience of life, full of the sensual effects of observation, but also employing a form of haptic visuality. Um, so in all of her still life, I feel that the potential fetishizing of the surface and of the subject is always present. As always, the work embodies still life as self-representation. Thank you.